Hello and welcome to a master class in Mariology. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. I am joined by my colleague and friend, Dr. Robert Festigi, who is uh, Chair of Systematics at Sacred Heart Major Seminary uh, in Detroit. Uh, I'm a Chair of Mariology at Franciscan University of Steubenville and also of Ave Maria University. And our goal is to provide you with a graduate or doctoral level seminar discussion regarding the foundational elements of Mariology. So in our first edition of Masterclass in Mariology, we discussed uh, the principal Old Testament references, uh, Genesis 3.15, Isaiah 7.14, Micah 5.2-3, as well as some of the other supportive texts, the beautiful references of uh, Isaiah uh, 66, uh, 7 regarding Our Lady's um, prophesying, uh, foreshadowing, for prefiguring uh, Our Lady's giving birth to Jesus uh, in a miraculous fashion. And so we're going to continue in part two by talking about, first of all, some of the major themes uh, in the Old Testament that prefigure Our Lady. Secondly, some of the particular types, uh, oftentimes inanimate types, uh, of what prefigures Our Lady. And then thirdly, what are sometimes called the strong women of the Old Testament. And let me say again, at the get-go, it's, it, it's, there's no way we could possibly in an hour program go through all of these types and themes. I mean, the richness of the mother in the New Testament is foreshadowed in the Old Testament. But our goal is to uh, put forward the principal themes, persons, types, uh, with an appropriate theological and mirological commentary. So with that, and uh, Robert, again, welcome. It's always a total gift to have you uh, joining us and, and uh, offering this service uh, to our listeners. Well, it's my honor, uh, Mark. I'm, I'm just honored to be here and uh, join you in this important discussion. Thank God. So let's begin with what I would consider the single greatest type of Our Lady in the Old Testament, and that's the Ark of the Covenant. So very basically, and again, we're going to have to summarize these concepts because we haven't even time to go through and read the whole massive biblical descriptions of these. But starting in Exodus 25, 10 and following, you have uh, God's directive to Moses to form an ark. So let's go to, to some basic elements of what this ark is. The ark is a sacred box. It is covered with gold. It is made of acacia wood, which uh, for the Hebrews was called incorruptible wood, which will have its own prefigurement in terms of Our Lady's uh, fullness of grace and sinlessness. And there are uh, two angels on the top of the ark, which is called the mercy seat. And again, Our Lady being the Mediatrix of Mercy, this also has a foreshadowing. I also found fascinating, uh, Robert, when the Ark went out, it was covered with a blue veil. And I thought, well, here you got, you got gold and you got blue. Uh, these are, you know, such clearly Marian even colors and the fact that, you know, the Ark would be veiled. Now, what's in the Ark? essentially three things. You have fragments from the Ten Commandments. You have uh, the rod of Aaron. Uh, and you have uh, elements of the manna, samples of the manna. So what's symbolized in those? Well, you've got the law, you've got priesthood, and you've got nourishment, uh, which we will talk about with the Eucharist. Also fascinating, uh, Robert, is the glory cloud, sometimes called the Shekinah, that the uh, ark would be accompanied, uh, and on special occasions, the, 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 this cloud would come down and overshadow, is the word the Old Testament uses, overshadow the ark. And when that happened, you knew that something really supernatural was happening, and, and as did the Israelites at the time. So, the symbolism, the foreshadowing should be somewhat obvious. At, at the Annunciation, Mary says yes, 
The Holy Spirit overshadows, which is a very particular word uh, in the Hebrew and the Greek, uh, overshadows her, and she becomes the new and everlasting ark because she has within her Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of priesthood. He's the fulfillment of law, and he becomes Eucharist for us. Uh, and even coming out of that scene of the Annunciation, uh, when they go to Ankarim, uh, to visit Elizabeth, uh, what happens? Well, Elizabeth says this line uh, from David, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Well, David says, who am I that the ark should come to me? And that expression, mother of my Lord, is an expression for another thematic type we'll deal with in just a moment, and that's Our Lady's role as queen mother. But of course, where the ark goes, the Shekinah goes. And so the Holy Spirit joins Mary and Mary's presence bringing Jesus in the womb causes the pre-sanctification of John and causes Elizabeth to prophesy. So again, it's it's the spirit and the bride. It's, it's the Shekinah and the ark. Uh, and so this is such a rich Old Testament theory. I, I know as a fact that certain Protestant pastors have become Catholic just because of this one image of Our Lady as Ark. So I know that's a mouthful, but but please jump in. Oh, well, thank you very much. This is a beautiful exposition. And what's interesting is we have the parallel of 2 Samuel 6, 9 and Luke uh, 1, 43, you know, where, where the Ark is brought into Jerusalem. David says, who am I that the Ark of my Lord should come? And that's precisely what Elizabeth says in who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And then we have another interesting parallel. David dances for joy before the ark coming in. Well, when Mary, the living ark, comes to Elizabeth, who dances? John the Baptist in the womb, in the womb of Elizabeth. She says, from the moment your greeting came to me, the child in my womb uh, uh, leaped for joy. So here even John the Baptist is like David leaping in the womb of Elizabeth. So the parallel is there. And then the other parallel is in the book of Revelation. You know, we, we get used to chapter and verse, but that only comes later on in, in tradition, first chapters and then later verses. But in Revelation 11, 19, which is uh, the, the Ark of the, Lord, of, of the Covenant is seen within the heavenly temple. And the very next line, and then a great sign appears, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. So we see the connection between the ark in heaven and Mary, uh, the living, uh, the, 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 the new ark of the covenant. And because she carried the new covenant in her womb. So, uh, so this is, the, the parallels are almost, they're undeniable. I think that's how we'd have to put it. You're absolutely right. They're undeniable and they're staggering. And there's a profundity, a beauty, a sublimity in how this goes uh, through. And, you know, I think um, as the ark is seen as in the Old Testament, there's also even more uh, wisdom and teaching that comes. For example, uh, you can only almost deduce this, this formula that when you have the ark plus priesthood, you have miracles happen. It's really rather extraordinary. So, for example, when the Israelites are crossing the Jordan and it's deep and they can't get by, what, what happens? Well, they call the priests forward to carry the ark and you have a miracle, which is the, the waters of the Jordan stopping. And it's you, you have the other miracle when you have the ark uh, processioned around the uh, walls of Jericho, uh, you know. And again, the priests do it. And I always find that interesting, Robert, because the people shout. Uh, why do the people shout? Well, because God respects the Volks Popoli. He respects the voice of the people. It's predominantly the ark and the priesthood, but that goes on as well. So you've got this, these miracles. I, I always liken it to John Paul II's consecration of the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the Berlin Wall come tumbling down. That's right. And in our era, we understood what the Berlin Wall meant. It meant communism is here to stay seemingly forever. We're not going to be able to tear this thing down. And then 
John Paul, the high priest, the vicar of Christ, summons, consecrates to the Ark, Our Lady, and then the Berlin Wall comes down. So uh, I think it's it's a it's a powerful image. I only make one other reference, which I think is telling, the time where the Israelites are fighting the Philistines, they lose, and they say, well, we need the Ark. So they bring the Ark, but there had been great infidelity, especially, not exclusively, especially with the sons of Eli, the, 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 the priests, sons who who had been unfaithful and so what happens they lead with the ark but they lose terribly and the ark is taken and it's kind of a reference of make a difference between understand the, the essential distinction between intercession and superstition the ark was not magic and because they weren't being faithful to the covenant the ark wasn't going to save them i say the same is true about our lady um, Our Lady is the generous mother, but it's not superstition. It's not magic. She's not a, a blue rabbit's foot. She's the queen of heaven and earth that has power, but that power presupposes our faith. And I think that's also lessons we learn uh, from the Old Testament arc examples. Exactly. And, and you know, the see, people might say, well, all right, you think the Mary's the Ark of the Covenant and Vestigi might, and you know, this is just private interpretation, but it's been affirmed by the magisterium of the church that blessed Pius IX in his papal bull, defining the Immaculate Conception, explicitly refers to Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. And it's there in the Litany of Loreto, which is papally approved and goes back centuries. So, I, I, in other words, we have. This is not just private theologians seeing this. This no. is the church affirming Mary as the Ark of the Covenant. And, right. more, and some people today say, well, or that woman in Revelation, she's the church. She represents Israel giving birth to the Messiah. That's true. But there is the Marian dimension. And so I, 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 in my class, I just provide a, you know, a list of all the popes up through Pope Francis saying this this clearly is Mary, the oh, woman okay. of Revelation 12. Right. And we'll bring that up. And I'm so glad you brought up, you know, Revelations 11, 19 and that reference. I mean, why do you go from ark to woman? Because the ark is the woman and the woman is the ark. And a 14th century divider uh, in terms of a chapter and verse, that doesn't change that. that I mean, those are not inspired. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, Simply put, and we've talked about this for, before, and we will, when we get to the New Testament, we'll, we'll go off to Revelations 12 specifically. You know, isn't it interesting uh, that only one woman in all history can put her hand up if somebody says, who gave birth to Jesus? You and I can't do it as church. Israel can't do it as Israel. In any way similar or, or, or on, on an equal level to the version of Nazareth. And that's, that's why also we've talked about before, if I consecrate myself to you, Robert, and you to me, with all due respect, that's not going to bring the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. That's right. uh, it's got to be to the queen who has the power because her son is the king. And that's only one woman, and that's Our Lady. So, excellent. So, in fact, let's go to some of these types. You made reference to Pius the Ninth, Blessed Pius the Ninth, in Ephibulus Deus, and in the definition of the Immaculate Conception, 1854, he he talks about, he names a couple of these types, Ark of Noah, Jacob Slatter, Burning Bush. Could could you uh could you make reference to that passage? Uh because well, I think it's a helpful Yes, yes, I have it, I have it uh, outlined here. And he said, you know, that he's talking about the fathers of the church beheld in the Ark of Noah, which was built by divine command and escaped entirely safe and sound from the common shipwreck of the whole world, the ladder which Jacob saw reaching from earth to heaven, by whose rungs the angels of God ascended and descended, and on whose top the Lord himself leaned, in that bush which Moses saw in the holy place, burning on all sides, which was not consumed or injured in any way, but grew green and blossomed beautifully in that impregnable tower, before the enemy from which hung a thousand bucklers and all the armor of the strong in that garden enclosed on all sides, which cannot be violated or corrupted or any deceit 
by any deceitful plots, as in that dis resplendent city of God, which has its foundations in the holy mountains, in that most august temple of God, which radiant with divine splendors is full of the glory of God, and in very many other biblical types of this kind, in such illusions the fathers taught uh, had been prophesied in wonderful manner the exalted dignity of the mother of God, her spotless innocence, and her sanctity unstained by any fault. So yeah, here's a pope just yeah. kind of summarizing the patristic insights in, into these. And, uh, you know, that it's almost, it's not completely exhausted, uh, exhaustive, but it's just so beautiful the way he summarizes this. Well, he, he does. And so, you know, you, you've got, even with specific, you have the Ark of Noah, which was built by divine command to escape the effects of sin. Well, that's that's the mother, because, in fact, she is the one who's going to be the Ark for Jesus, if you will. And then later, uh, I always love that the Ark of Noah, you know, switches where that, that you know, the Ark of the Covenant uh, the, the covenant of the ark, so to speak, becomes the ark of the covenant. But later, then we have Jacob's ladder, and that's an uh, uh, an image of Our Lady's intercession, the ladder of angels, uh, and the heavenly ladder from heaven to earth, indicating that dimension. Then you got the burning bush. Now, some might say, "Well, aren't you going too far here? You know, the burning bush. You're, you're seeing Mary and everything. Look, as Pius the Ninth says, the bush." held, contained the presence of God, but without material corruption. Exactly as Our Lady contained the presence of God without material corruption. That's why she has her glorious assumption. Um, and so many others, the, the impenetrable tower, uh, the the uh, and, and the, gar the impenetrable garden, the enclosed garden, which indicates Mary's uh, perfect and perpetual virginity. And yes, it is on and on, but but it's a glorious on and on because th these are all images the fathers repeatedly used. And again, I think Brant Petrie does an excellent job with this, especially uh, with the fathers in the in the unanimity of the fathers regarding these types of Mary, which which so often reflect her specific um, doctrines and dogmas. That, that's correct. And I mean, these make their way into the prayer life of the church, the, the liturgical life of the church. And you know, the, the, you, you mentioned Jacob's ladder, you know, which is like the connection between heaven and earth. He sees this. And, and St. John of Damascus, a great father of the church, uh, uh, died in the eighth century. This is what he, see, he says uh, regarding that. You know, speaking to Mary, so also you, having become the mediator and ladder for the descent to us of God, who took on the weakness of our substance, embracing it and uniting it you, intimately to himself, and made man a spirit that sees, have reunited what is divided. You know, therefore the angels came down to him to serve him as God and Lord and men, leading an evangelical life. But he sees he sees Mary as prophesied in Jacob's ladder. And then connected with this is also Mary as the gate of heaven, mm -hmm. which appears in the in the in the uh, litany of Loreto, but also the ancient Byzantine hymn, the Akathist hymn. She's right. the gateway. She's the gateway to heaven. And we, we wonder, what, what, how is she the gateway? Well, this is what the Akathist hymn says. Uh, Hail, O lady, unique gateway through whom the Lord alone has passed. Hail, O you who through your maternity have shattered the locks of Hades. Hail, divine access towards salvation for the saved. O you so perfectly worthy of our praise. But you, it's, it's just, and this goes back to the fifth or sixth century. All right, so that, and that that's the point is, unless you study this stuff, you don't realize that, it's almost like Cheshire and talking about rediscovering England. This is not new. This is, you know, you're making reference to John Damascene in the eighth century, and Andrew of Crete and Germain of Constantinople, and then the Agath, uh, 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 the uh, him, um, which is fifth, as you say, fifth or sixth century, uh, and 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 Ephraim and and Romanus the Melodist, who some think uh, is the author of the. I got this hymn. Uh, 
this was so rich. I mean, I've got students, I've got grad students that sometimes start tearing because they're saying, I can't believe this stuff was in the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh centuries. Uh, and so some ways we suffer from a bit of a post-Protestant idea of Our Lady without realizing, no, we got to get back to what they understood um, because the richness, I mean, as the richness of, and, and Cyril of Alexandria at the Council of Ephesus, you know, his, his famous mediatrix homily, these are stunning doctrinal and, and poetic beauties uh, which which so merit our respect. So, Robert, let me ask you about, so going back to themes for a moment, um, the theme, Daughter Zion, that's a theme that's mentioned at Vatican II. Cardinal Ratzinger wrote a book called, you know, Daughter Zion in the late 70s, which had some very beautiful things and had some interesting things, which we'll comment on. But can, can you give us a, just a basic summary of this thematic type of Our Lady in the Old Testament? Yes, exactly. Well, you, you know, as daughter Zion, Mary really represents, uh, she, she represents Israel mm -hmm. waiting for the Messiah. So here's the, the prophecy from Zechar, uh, Zechariah uh, 2, 14. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come and will dwell in the midst of you. Well, this is Mary as the mother of Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. Emmanuel means God with us. And of course, you know, you mentioned before the Shekinah, the, the holy presence of God, but that this is this is God himself, Emmanuel. I will dwell in the midst of you, and the one who uh, brings the Lord to us is the daughter of Zion. Sing and rejoice. O daughter of Zion. Now, Zion represents Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. you know, that's another name for, for Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is also compared in the book of Revelation to the bride, the new Jerusalem, ready to, to unite with the bridegroom, Christ. So Mary has this uh, really bridal dimension where she, as the daughter of Zion, is the, is the, is the means by which God is united to us. That's why Pope Francis referred to Mary as the bridge between us and God. Yeah, so yeah, she yeah. unites heaven and earth. I was thinking of that reference as you were talking about the, you know, with with the Akathist hymn, with these other early references with, uh, you know, Francis called her the bridge between God and humanity. That's so extraordinary. Uh, so, right. And in, in Isaiah, it's both daughter Zion and mother Zion. And the, so, so those of Zion are the faithful. It's almost like a first cousin concept to the remnant. Those who hold on to the covenant, no matter what, they are the faithful followers uh, of the covenant and both indicated as daughter uh, and as, as mother. I have to say just uh, briefly in, in that Ratzinger book, which is 1970, uh, I think it's 77, I remember correctly, but you know he talks about his own progress in terms of Marian development. And look, if you're publishing uh, like a Ratzinger is going to publish, there's going to be that progress. I, I always uh, was taken back a little bit that reading in that book, he says, well, there's not really a foundation for the assumption of Mary. It, it really comes out of kind of popular belief. And of course, there's a foundation for the assumption of Mary. It's called scripture, tradition, and the magisterium, but, but even scripture and tradition. So, but, but, you know, as we've talked about before, he was a little bit more of a Rhineland theologian in the early goings. And then he talks about in his uh, in his interview, Ratzinger Report in, in 84, how much he grew to understand that Mary was the crusher of heresies. Mary was the scepter of orthodoxy and how, very specifically, we're not going to be able to get out of crisis in the church until we turn to Our Lady. Uh, and so he really showed humility and, 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 uh, and development. Yes, exactly. And, you know, my, my colleague, Father J. Michael McDermott, translated Daughter Zion from German into English. And he also was hesitant about some of these, these Marian themes. But then by an email recently, he says, yeah, I've come around. I understand Mary as co-redemptrix. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So and, let's and, go and, to another theme, if we can. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, 
we could do this for days because you're talking about so much richness, but just to try to, you know, give our listeners and viewers uh, so, some of these high points. Uh, let's go to what's called the queen mother tradition oh. in the uh, Old Testament. So if I can lay it out essentially and then ask for your, your further comment. In the line of the kings of David, you always had uh, not one of the wives, in Solomon's case, some 700 plus, 600 plus, but you had the mother of the king that became, in Hebrew, the Gibirah, uh, literally the great lady. And her role in the dynastic kingdom was really very important. First of all, she was the principal intercessor from the people to the king. But secondly, she also was in charge of what was called dynastic succession. That is to say, if something happened to the king, it was up to the queen mother to designate who would be the successor. Now, Robert, that, that's a powerful position. That's not just um, figurehead stuff. That's a real role in the security <coughs> excuse me, and, and safety of the kingdom determining the successor. And so she in in first kings 2 19 and, and and many other places there's a reference for example between um Bathsheba and, and solomon uh she walks in she has a throne on the right side of the king everybody bows to the queen mother including the king only the king would bow to the queen mother and there's that famous line uh, of solomon saying ask mother what you will i will refuse you nothing so you're talking about a very established position in the Davidic kingdom. And of course, when you have a new king, i.e. Jesus Christ, the king of kings, you're going to have a new Gebirah, a new queen mother. And she's going to have the same role. She's going to be the principal intercessor from the people to the king, but she's also going to have a key role in the kingdom because she is mother of the king. So the, the, the and her role as advocate is always very much tied to her queenship uh, in, in the Old Testament. So your thoughts on the queen mother? Yes, I think it's so deeply established in scripture and, and tradition. And uh, and of course we have uh, a feast, you know, of, of the queenship of Mary, you know, uh, established by a venerable Pius XII. And he, he goes into great detail why she must be considered the queen and honor her because there had been the feast of Christ the king, now we need Mary the queen. And so we have <clears throat> the two working together. But I think when I think of Mary's uh, intercessory power as queen, um, it, 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 it's supported by some remarkable statements of popes who uh, recognize her most powerful intercessory authority. And, and, and during the midst of World War One, Pope Benedict the Fifteenth um, uh, uh, gives a discourse, and and he talks about Mary as her suppliant omnipotence. Now, the mediatrix of every grace. This was December twenty fourth, nineteen fifteen, just as the 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 war is is is, is starting to break out. Then, uh, uh, two years later, May fifth, nineteen seventeen, he prays for peace. Uh, and he adds the invocation, Queen of Peace, to the litany of Loreto. And then he also prays that Mary, who is the mother of mercy and omnipotent by grace, may be moved by the agonizing cries of mothers and wives, the wailing of innocent children, to obtain for the stricken world the peace that is asked. But he, call, he, he, he again refers to her as omnipotente per gratia. Right. And, let, and let's and explain we, what that means. Let's because that's a beautiful. I'm so glad you bring that up. Uh, it means that Mary is not uh, omnipotent. She's not all powerful by nature. She's not God. No. But in the order of grace, in the order of participation in the divine nature, which as St. Thomas says, is always based on your vocation, your role, your predestination, what you're called to do. God doesn't ask you to do something and then not give you the ability to do it. So if Mary is going to be the mother of all peoples, the queen of heaven and earth, and the advocate for all humanity, that means she's going to be able to participate in the divine powers to do so. And that's what suppliant omnipotence means. Omnipotent in the order of intercession, not in the order of nature. Exactly, exactly. And St. John Paul II 
in a general audience, 1979, uh, does refer to her omnipotence of intercession. And then in his apostolic letter, Rosarium Virginis Mariae of 2002, he refers to Blessed Bartolo Longo, mm -hmm. who had been a Satanist and then uh, was assured that if he promoted the rosary, he could get out of the clutches of his prior a satanic uh, a, 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 a promise of adherence to Satan. And so he he relied upon the Blessed Virgin Mary, and he also repeated the phrase that Mary is omnipotent by grace, omnipotens per gratiam. And St. John Paul II refers to this, uh, and he says uh, that, um, he, he, he says, the, the, the rosary is both meditation and supplication. Insistent prayer to the mother of God is based on confidence that her maternal intercession can obtain all things from the heart of her son. She is all powerful by grace, omnipotens per gratiam, to use the bold expression which needs to be properly understood of blessed Bartolo Longo, who died in 1926. So, so here, again, we have papal approval and use of these very uh, uh, powerful uh, uh, rec uh, 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 affirmations of Mary's omnipotence of intercession. It, yes. it, but it's by grace. She's not the source of grace, as St. Pius the, the Tenth so beautifully explained, but she is like the aqueduct of grace. Right. And so she has as mother a type of authority that no other human being, no other creature could really uh, 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 um, uh, claim. That's right. We, and I'm so glad you use the word authority because there is a maternal authority in Our Lady that has to be respected. Not just piety, not just a nice devotional thing. It's a supernatural authority because her son is the king. And so that's why along with you know Our Lady as as mother of the church, which is profoundly beautiful. It's also important to remember she's queen of the church and that her motherhood and queenship extends even beyond the church to all humanity. You know, Sheen has these wonderful, Archbishop Sheen has these wonderful images of saying, even in non-Christian uh, uh, religions, and I, I don't want to stray too far from our topic here, but even in non-Christian religions, Mary is the fifth column, she's the Trojan horse, because people who are not Christian can't say the Our Father, but they can pray the Hail Mary. And Mary is always in anticipating, trying to uh, intercede and bring actual grace, leading them to sanctifying grace. But that's an, that's an authority Jesus finally gives her at Calvary, when he says, woman, behold your son, and then to John, behold your mother. So it's a maternal authority with 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 great power. And I think again, um, you know, I, I couldn't help as you were talking about omnipotence by grace, Robert. That uh, that prenotanda that happened for the first schema, uh, Vatican II, where it says, you know, these titles are all true in themselves, among which is co-redemptrix of the human race, but we are omitting them out of concern that they may be misunderstood by separated brethren, that is Protestant. That's a quote. Robert, if we use that criterion, what may be misunderstood by our separated brethren, the pre well, there goes the Eucharist, there goes the papacy, there goes five of the seven sacraments, and there goes the full truth about Our Lady. So I'm sure the group that did not, that, that took out of the first schema, uh, co-redemptrix, is, is the same kind of group that would, uh, bristle at the idea of suppliant omnipotence. The problem is, it's absolutely true. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> that, that uh, you, you, you know, it maybe it would make its way into uh, that title, Co-Redemptrix didn't make its way into Lumen Gentium chapter eight, but the, the theme, the concept is certainly there as we've talked about before in Lumen Gentium 56, 58, 61, and also her, her supreme intercessory power is 
is affirmed in Lumen Gentium 62, taken up to heaven. She did not leave, uh, uh, leave aside her maternal duty. It's really Munis, her mm -hmm. office, uh, of bringing the gifts of, of salvation to us. So she's the mother in heaven interceding in the most powerful way. Yeah. And this has been, this is the instinct of the faith, but it's been affirmed by popes uh, many, many times and in right. the that's, prayer life of the church. Right. And that's what keeps us on the right track. Speaking of the right track, let's go to Old Testament types of Mary, which is personified by what are sometimes called the strong women of the Old Testament. I find this fascinating and, and uh, very enriching. And um, if I can, we could start with Sarah. This is Genesis 11. And uh, Sarah, of course, is the wife of Abraham. And uh, Sarah gives a miraculous birth to Isaac, not because uh, there was a genetic issue as much as there was a age issue. She was past the, the point of childbearing. So it's still a miraculous birth. But then I find it fascinating that Sarah is later called the mother of all nations because God couldn't keep his promise to Abraham to have as many descendants as the sand on the shore of the sea without who? Sarah. And so Sarah is a woman intimately involved in the fulfillment of the covenant between God and Abraham in terms of this huge offspring of descendants. That's why she's called mother of all, na uh, mother of all nations, and that's why we today call Our Lady the mother of all peoples. Exactly, exactly. And she's also called the free woman. And and so uh, Father Stefano Manelli and others see in this a sign that Mary was free from original sin. So there's, a, there's an illusion there. But also it's interesting that uh, Sarah, of course, is a woman. She pre prefigures Mary. But St. John Paul II and others have seen even in Abraham, in his willingness to sacrifice the child of the covenant, you know, uh, Isaac, that he prefigures Mary's incredible faith that, uh, uh, and that she was willing also to sacrifice her son to fulfill God's plan. That's right. And, John Paul has a beautiful homily on that. And, and notice there's no ram found in a thicket to substitute for Jesus. Uh, Mary has to offer her son in full immolation and to use even, you know, Lumen Gentiums. You know, we've talked about, uh, you know, certain elements of Lumen Gentium that could be stronger. Well, when they talk about consenting to the immolation of the victim in Lumen Gentium 58, that's about as strong as it gets. That Mary had to say yes to the destruction, to the annihilation of her son, the victim. Well, Abraham didn't have to. He becomes the father of faith by exercising faith. But Mary had to follow through with that and offer her son. So, yeah, it's very powerful with that. Let's go to Rebecca. Uh, the, uh, this is Genesis 24 now, 60, um, the wife of Isaac. And some would say, well, wait a minute. Didn't, didn't Rebecca have a little bit of dubious intercession in terms of, of her uh, getting Jacob the the inheritance. Uh, let me give the narrative and then get your comments if that's okay. So essentially, <clears throat> uh, you, we have uh, Isaac now, who is uh, old and blind, and he's going to give his birthright. He's supposed to go to Esau. And Rebecca, uh, and evidently Esau was kind of a big hairy guy. And so Rebecca straps you know, skins on the arms of Jacob and tells Jacob that, uh, excuse me, tells Isaac that this is your son Esau. And though he, so Isaac gives the birthright to uh, Jacob instead of Esau. Now, uh, de Montfort, I think, has a wonderful interpretation of this, St. Louis Marie. He says, what Rebecca did for Jacob our Lady does for each one of us, insofar as she disguises us in Christ. And therefore, we get the inheritance we don't deserve. And so 
even though none of the women we're talking about are going to be a perfect image of Our Lady because none of them are immaculate, it's a beautiful reference of maternal intercession. De Montfort will throw in also, and by the way, uh, Esau wasn't too concerned about the birthright because he was willing to give it up for a bowl of lentils, which doesn't show great respect for it. So uh, I just find the Rebecca and, and really St. Louis Marie's commentary on that to be fascinating. Intercession, the same way we get what we don't deserve. Very, yes, very good. And there's, uh, there's a, a few other elements to this uh, about Rebecca. Uh, her consent to marry Isaac was requested. And just as God has to have Mary's consent, this is this is uh, what, what what Leo the Thirteenth and also Vatican II explains. God did not want to become man without the free uh, consent of the mother, and so Rebecca gives free consent because back then, you know, many marriages were arranged, but it specifically said her her uh, consent to marry Isaac was requested, and also. Father Manelli, again, uh, has this insight that Rebecca dresses Jacob in the clothes of Esau so that he will receive the, the, the blessing from Isaac. But Mary allows the word of God to be dressed in human flesh. So she also provides the, the you know, the, uh, the, the flesh, which is the kind of covering, although he does become fully flesh, you know, uh, uh, full human nature. But in other words, the word of God becomes dressed in human flesh because of Mary's mediation. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And by the way, let me quickly make reference. Um, in the Mariology book, uh, this, this is Mariology for Priest, Deacon, Seminarian, which is distributed by Queenship Publications. Uh, there's an outstanding uh, first chapter by Father Stefano Manelli on the Old Testament. Second chapter, which we'll be getting into in our next two programs, uh, at least next two programs, uh, on Our Lady in the New Testament. Uh, but also, Father Manelli has a great single book called All Generations Will Call Me Blessed. Uh, and that's excellent. And that's also a, a more thorough treatment if you wanted to double back and get more of the sources of what we're talking about. Okay, so let's go to Rachel. So uh, again, uh, and again, I think Brand Petrie, Petrie does an excellent job on this. So, you know... Rachel is the wife of Jacob, um, and of course, Joseph, her son, is sold for 20 pieces of silver, uh, which is obviously an image of Jesus. But there's a fascinating background, and we talked about this in the last program, so we won't go over it in, 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 in full detail, but the idea that Rachel was the mother of sorrow for the Jewish people, that yeah. um, you know, she, in fact, dies giving birth to Bononi, uh, who is his name is changed uh, to Benjamin uh, by by Jacob, but it's son of suffering because she she dies giving birth, and so Rachel has this whole theme of being a mother of sorrows, and even as I mentioned in our in uh, in the previous uh, episode, there is at her tomb many uh, Jewish people, Orthodox Jewish people, who come and pray for family needs to Rachel. So I mean, how profound. Uh, this is of Our Lady as the Mother of Sorrows, again, which is a liturgical way of saying that she's the co-redemptrix. Exactly, exactly. And, and what we find in Jeremiah 31, 15, is a reference to uh, Rachel crying from the other side. Yeah. She weeps for her children even after her death. So this is like testimony that even after her death, she's an intercessor. And then this is also repeated after the slaughter of the innocents in the Gospel of Matthew, that this is to fulfill that prophecy about the weeping, the wailing of Rachel. So she wails and weeps for her children. And then Mary is the mother of sorrows. And uh, she, she was united in uh, the death of her son. Uh, she didn't die physically, but it, in her heart, she unites herself to that sacrifice. So she's the supreme mother of sorrows and she has even greater intercessory power than, than Rachel, but that the Jewish tradition to this day recognizes Rachel's intercessory power. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's why they go. And by the way, why is she buried very close to Bethlehem? That's where her tomb is. Well, that's of course where our Lord is born. So the link between Rachel and Mary is quite profound, but that 
that weeping for the children. So Mary continues to intercede. And as, as Pius X explains in his encyclical of 1904, Adium Illum, the, the, the book of Revelation speaks about uh, the woman wailing in, in, in pain, giving birth. He says, well, what birth was this? And he sees it as Mary's uh, 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 crying over seeing so many uh, children of her son and her children lost to sin. So right. there's this kind of uh, sorrowful mother that continues, just like Rachel weeps from heaven uh, at, at the slaughter of the innocents. So also Our Lady continues as the sorrowful mother to join in weeping over uh, human tragedy and sin. Exactly. Yeah. And so we've got, I mean, again, we could go on so many. I want to hit maybe just three or four more types, persons, uh, because they are uh, so rich. Uh, let's go to uh, Miriam, uh, the one Mary of the Old Testament. So Miriam is the sister of Moses and Aaron. And, you know, Miriam can rightly call the mediator, the uh, mediatrix to the mediator, because it's Miriam that follows the baby Moses going down the river and sees that the daughter of Pharaoh picks him out and that it's Miriam who says, I know a wet nurse that can, that can feed this child. So in a real sense, Miriam is a mediatrix, which is just a female mediator for Moses, the great Old Testament mediator. And this obviously refers to our blessed mother who, and even Protestant theologians, some are, are granting this, which I think is just beautiful, that Mary is the mediatrix of the mediator. Mary says yes, without her yes, we don't get the mediator. So again, she is the new Miriam uh, in, in a very powerful form. Even the name Miriam, uh, they say, uh, means essentially bitter or sorrow. Well, there again, we've got that co redemptrix theme that yes, she will mediate for Jesus, but it will cost something. It will cost great suffering, great sorrow. Exactly, exactly. And in, in, in the book of the book of the prophet Micah six four uh, links Moses, Aaron, and Miriam together as co equals. You know, so she's a, she shares in this uh, prophetic work in collaboration with the liberation of Israel from slavery. So Mary collaborates with the new Moses, right, and the high priest. So Aaron could only be a prefigurement. Actually, Melchizedek is a stronger prefigurement of Christ's priesthood. But uh, Jesus is the prophet and the priest and also the king. But Miriam is there involved in the, in the mediation of the liberation. So she's put on equal footing with the prophet and the priest. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. And so we've got two um, women crushing heads examples, which we're going to go over very briefly. But uh, one is the great case of um, Judith cutting off the head of Holofernes. Uh, and, uh, you know, imagine the strength that takes, Judith leading her people against this. The other is the combination of Deborah and Jael, who puts a spike through the head of Sisera, uh, the the opposing army. And so what are those? Those are Genesis 3.15 foreshadowments and continuations. A woman will crush the head. And, you know, that's that's again Our Lady in, a in I think, a fully uh, Catholic understanding of Genesis 3.15. And also, quite frankly, just ubiquity in all the Marian apparitions where she clearly has her foot on the head of the adversary. Exactly, exactly. And, of course, what was the, the motivation of Deborah and, and Judith to save God's people? So now all of humanity is, is uh, our people of the covenant. In other words, the covenant's been extended to the Gentiles now through Christ. So she intercedes. She doesn't do it through violent means, mm -hmm. but she does it through, uh, through her immaculate conception, her conception and giving birth to our Lord and her collaboration and union with Christ in the uh, work of redemption. Exactly. And she does it with, as we said before, a maternal authority. Uh, there is authority in a woman crushing the head of the adversary. And someone who's clear about that authority is Satan. 
you know, I, I've, I've read so many references by so many exorcists that say certain, uh, uh, one recent one by Monsignor Rossetti uh, was talking about a case where he was expelling Beelzebul and uh, that was, he was kind of the lead demon in this exorcist case, and but Satan was behind. And Beelzebul left early because he said, uh, Father Rosette said, Mary is coming, Our Lady is coming. And he didn't want the humiliation no. of being expelled by her. And so that's real power. It's not violence in the physical order, but it's certainly power in the spiritual order. Uh, let's go to Esther. Um, Queen Esther, and again, we're not doing these justice, but at least to highlight these, and we're going to have to pass over Ruth and so many and Hannah, so many other references. But Queen Esther risks her life to save the Jewish people from the unjust efforts of Mordecai and others who are seeking to undermine uh, the Jewish presence with King Ahasuerus. So Queen Esther enters uh, the courtroom. I always tell the students, now, those are intense office hours. If you come in without an appointment, you die. But those were the office hours. Those were the court hours of the king. But Esther risks her life to save her people. And in that way, Esther is both queen, but also co-redemptrix. That's right. And, and she was an extraordinarily beautiful woman. And our Mary, uh, the Blessed Mother, of course, is totopulcra, all uh, uh, beautiful. And she becomes then the queen of, the, of Persia. Because uh, her her husband Ahasuerus or Xerxes the first is the Persian king, but then this one military leader, this one uh, prime minister, so to speak, Haman, uh, because he's insulted by uh, Mordecai, who didn't want, who was Jewish, who couldn't pay him the the proper homage. He says, "I'm going to exterminate all the Jews," and and so. Uh, uh, <laughs> that Esther intercedes and she persuades uh, uh, Xerxes the first or Ahasuerus, you know, to stop this. So Mary is, you know, Esther there is the great intercessor as queen mother, as the queen, she, she intercedes to the king to stop, uh, in this case, the destruction of the people. So yeah. Mary intercedes as queen and, uh, but but to stop the, the our 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 destruction through sin, right? And, 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 yeah. and you're yeah exactly was Mordecai of course was the Jewish uh, yeah. uncle if I remember correctly, but relative of of Esther. But it's also a sign that her um, the fact that she becomes queen of Persia is a sign of the universality of her queenship, which also reveals Our Lady's universality. She's queen of all. She's queen of Muslims and Hindus and Buddhists and right. atheists and even Satanists in the sense that she has been given a task by Jesus to intercede for their souls as a mother. Whether or not they respond remains in the domain of human freedom, but that doesn't limit Our Lady's proper role as, as the mother of all peoples. Robert, we have time only for one more, unfortunately, and that is um, the mother of Maccabees. Now, in... Uh, Second Maccabees seven, we have the occasion where, and this is really so such a dramatic uh, event where uh, the mother and it's under the unjust uh, reign of Archelaus, the the the, the Greek uh, uh, authority in the region, and so the mother comes in with seven sons, and one son after another, <coughs> excuse me, refuses to violate the covenant by. Um, violating uh, the dietary practices. And it finally gets to the seventh son. And, you know, you got to realize this is a mother watching seven, six so far of her children being slain. So can you comment on that, please? Yes, yeah, she encourages <laughs> him. And she expresses absolute faith in the power of God. And, you know, he's going to you know have his body cut cut apart and so on but she says you know be be courageous god cre I, I don't i know i gave birth to you but it's really from the power of god and god created this universe not from something which previously existed this is actually quoted in the catechism yeah. as, as 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 support for creation from nothing 
so this unnamed mother of of the seven martyrs but that she has absolute confidence in god and then she as a mother encourages you know to for, for him to sacrifice his life his body for the sake of god's law so mary gives consent as we've spoken about before to the immolation of her son she lovingly consents to this or as benedict the 15th in inter sodalicia explains she gives up her maternal rights mm -hmm. over her son but here's the mother of the maccabean martyrs encouraging them and giving them assurance she has a kind of confidence in the resurrection and so we i think it's it's generally understood that though mary suffered under the cross uh seeing her son tortured to death she had absolute confidence in god that he would be resurrected that this was not the end and that this was the will of god how as hard as it was for her even our lord struggled with it in the agony of the garden in his human will but not as i will but as thy, thy will and so his human will was in perfect accord with his divine will which was one with the will of the father right, so right. this is deep mystery but maybe you could add some thoughts to this she well only two postscripts as, as we got to bring it to a close one is you know we read about the seven sons but we forget that if you read on in the passage, the mother herself is martyred. Yeah. And so then you have the mother's martyred. I've always seen this, Robert, as the most profound Old Testament prophecy of the seven sorrows of Our Lady. Mm -hmm. That those sons represented the seven ways that Our Lady's heart was pierced because she was true to the new covenant. She was true to the plan of redemption. And all of those were innocent sufferings that came in different ways at different parts of her life only because she was, in fact, the human co-redentrix with the divine redeemer, and this was required of her. So there's a difference when Vatican II in Lumen Gentium 58 says she consented. It means more than she just endured. It means she said yes. John Paul calls it the second sorrowful fiat at Calvary that the son would be immolated so that she could give birth to all of us. That's why, as, as the fathers say, Mary would not have two painful births. The first birth would be joyful. The second birth would be painful. And so that's the pain that she has on John 19, uh, giving birth to all of us. So, but any, I've got to conclude it, Robert, but any final uh, uh, input that you'd like to put? Uh, well, what you said was very, very, very much supported by the liturgical life of the church. This is the uh, preface for the mass of Mary at the foot of the cross number two. And it says, she was to be a partner in his passion. And she who had given him birth without the pains of childbirth was to endure the greatest of pains in bringing forth new life to the family of your church. It's also beautifully in interconnected. Immaculate Conception, total virginity, co-redemption, as a result, mediation of all graces, advocacy, bringing our needs to humanity. It's all the one. And it's so profoundly foreshadowed in the Old Testament. So, Robert, thank you for uh, our kind of blitzkrieg run through the Old Testament. But uh, God willing, we were able to uh, at least highlight principal themes, persons, and types. Uh, and uh, thank you for for your uh, invaluable contribution to it. And uh, oh, thank you. I learn a lot too in doing this in preparation, but also in listening to you. Well, we thank, thank God. You and much. thank you, our listeners and viewers. We will continue again. A masterclass in Mariology is our effort to try to make available to anybody in the world a doctoral or graduate level seminar discussion on the great truths of our sweet lady. We will continue in our next episode with Our Lady in the New Testament. Thanks so much for being with us and God bless you all.